Mine is minus three. I'm um, having downturns yet. The Royal Market here, and I'm happy that uh, theater is involved in this festival <coughs> with a lot of actors participating in different ways. And we will see this tonight also. Um, we will not um, uh, invite uh, Alain Sixou and Marciek to enter the stage yet because uh, we will have a prologue, or let's say two prologues. We will, for some minutes, transform this venue to a cinema and a little theater. And um, you will get some presentations of the two participants, of course, but let's go directly into uh, the first prologue, which is a Film. It's a 20 minute film made in 1991 by Marciek. It's called Gammal och Dur. Gammal och Dur. Uh, in English, uh, a little twist of the word door, and you have died. Uh, Gammal och Dur, the main uh, lead. Dancer is uh, Edith Kullberg. It was recorded when she was 83 years old. And uh, you will also see a younger couple uh, danced by Anna Laguna and Ivan Asueli. Uh, we will not play the whole film, uh, but you will have an eight or nine minute excerpt. That's the first part. Okay?
time to 1976, because in February 76 uh, was the first night for a play by Ella Sisu called Portrait of Dora. And um, Dora is a case by, uh, described by Sigmund Freud, one of his famous case studies. Um, it's a very um, investigated and discussed case for, for several reasons. Um, all the time there are new uh, seminars and, and books around Dora. There's a Dora lo Dorality around her. Um, she was an 18 year old uh, girl in Vienna. She lived quite close to Freud in Bergenkasse. And um, one thing that made her, uh, this case so important is that she, uh, she decided to stop the treatment. She left, so she said no. Um, and this caused Freud to uh, reflect very much on the relationship between the analyst and the patient. Um, we will give you some uh, uh, about 14 15 minutes uh, in a montage from uh, Six of And I will describe uh, a little for you so you will understand what's going on uh, with uh, the help of the actors taking their positions. So please come to the stage. That is Rebecca. Rebecca Hamster, you are Dora. You are this 18 year old girl, uh, and it, uh, you don't go to uh, Dr. Freud uh, by your own uh, initiative. It is your father, Pontus Gustafsson, who thinks it's very important that she goes. And Freud, uh, who is Freud now? It's Johann Holmberg, Sigmund Freud. For, for him, it's uh, an important and good uh, patient because she shows uh, symptoms that were described at this time as uh, hysterical. Uh, there's a third man here. Um, it is like this, that um, the father has a secret relationship to the wife of Mr. K, Erik Ehm. Uh, he does not want to have that talked about. So that's his underlying mission when he takes uh, Dora to a single point. Uh, and why does, uh, why is it okay for Mr. K? Well, Mr. K passes advances towards Dora. So it's kind of three men uh, having a game. And uh, Dora, she has an eye for this. Elasixus' play is not uh, from A to B to C. It's not an Ibsen play. Uh, it's a hypothetical and, and uh, discussion wise thing. Just quite much as uh, Sigmund Freud's description, too. Okay. That's it. Prologue number two. Hysterikorna är mina systrar. Jag har varit Dora i alla hennes roller. De som dödar henne. De hon färdas igenom. Och de som hon får att rysa. År 1900 var jag hennes klädda begär. Hennes raseri, hennes stormiga handlingar. Jag tillät inte den småaktiga, borgerligt äktenskapliga karusellen att snurra utan att gnissla försäkert. Jag såg allt. Jag sa ingenting. Men jag avslöjade allt. Till slut flydde jag. Men jag är vad Dora skulle ha varit om kvinnornas historia hade börjat. De här händelserna 
framträder som en skugga i en grön. Om man går okunnigt eller oförsiktigt fram kan man inte avgöra om scenen verkligen har ägt rum. Om ni vågar kyssa mig får ni en örfil. Våga bara kyssa mig så får ni en örfil. Doktor Freud? Ni ska berätta för mig om scenen vid sjön. Med Herr K. Varför höll jag tyst de första dagarna efter scenen vid sjön med Herr K? Och varför berättade jag sedan helt plötsligt om saker för mina föräldrar? Varför? Tror ni? Herr K. har alltid uppsett väldigt mot min dotter. Han tog promenader med henne. Han gav henne små presenter. Och och vakade över en nästan faderlig vänhet. Dora är inget barn längre. Jag förlåter dig aldrig. Jag förstår mig inte på dig. Du förstår nog. Du tänker bara på din egen njutning. Min far är mycket generös. Han tycker om att göra den stackars fru K glad. Dora är ett barn. Jag skulle ha kunnat tycka om här K. Men efter scenen vid sjön är det omöjligt. Jag har inte gjort någonting som vi känner att tolkas på det viset. Hon har antagligen inbillat sig hela scenen i sjön. Har ni det? Ja. Så snart jag förstod vad Herr K. ville gav jag honom en örfil och flydde. Jag förstod hans ord. Jag gav honom en örfil och flydde. Jag råkar känna Herr K. Det är en ung man. Det en man som här K kan omöjligen ha som avsikt. Jag hade förstås inbillat mig det där. Han sa, ni vet ju att min fru inte betyder någonting för mig. Jag gav honom en örfri och flydde. Så snart fru K förstod vad pappa ville avbröta honom. Hon gav honom en örfri och flydde. Och du säger att jag har inbillat mig. Välj nu, välj. Så skrik inte. Hon är jag. Herr B är känd för sitt garanta sätt mot damerna. Han vet hur totalt osjälviska mina omsorger varit. Det var inte precis i sjön. Det var i skogen. Jag hade förstått vad Herr K. ville för länge sedan. Medan vi promenerade hade han rullat en cigarett. Ingen rök utan här. Jag rökte också. Han hade rullat en cigarett hos mig. Han luktade rök. Jag avskyr rökten av rök. Min dotter har haft besvärande andning ända sedan hon var åtta år. Hon har varit mycket känslig. Och en mor. Min fru betyder inte mycket för mig tyvärr. När min far var sjuk var det för K som hjälpte honom. Migränen och de nervösa hostanfallen de började när han var två. Men förhållandet blev det inte tid för någon jag är fäst vid fru K med sann vänskap. Dora avgudar henne. Jag har aldrig sett en så vacker kvinna. Och jag älskade att se på henne. Jag tänkte att hon kunde allt som kvinnor ska kunna. När min far hon bytte rum och gjorde sig ungefär med i rummen längst bort förstod jag allt. Hör du mig? Allt. Fru K är nervös lagd, hon också. Och med tanke på min svaga hälsa och hennes öntåliga natur så förstår ni säkert att vi bara har vänskapliga känslor för varandra. Doras fjärnklädd är orättvis. Varför har jag aldrig avslöjat den här historien för någon? Utan för mig. Det är mörkt här. Vänta lite, jag ska bara föra ner skärsyerna så är jag ner. Onödigt att öppna. Det är alltid öppet. Jag kan öppna. Låt att ni öppna. Det som är öppet kan inte vara öppet. Det som har hänt kan inte ha hänt. Tycker du om att skriva? Ja. Nej. Ta den här gången bredet. Vilket brev? Det låg i hennes sekretär och skrev att hon inte orkade leva längre. Det stod, ni ville det. Hur kunde du hitta det där brevet? Var är inlåst och insekretär? Vem har nyckeln? Du älskar mig inte. Tror du inte att jag ser er? Du överger mig. Du älskar henne mer än mig. Tror du att du kan köpa mig? Tror du att du kan sälja mig? Dora, mina 
Vad tyckte ni om fru K. före händelsen? Jag är säker på att det var hon som hade dragsmyckorna som jag fick av min far. Hon sa, när jag kallade henne, jag, bakom henne, hennes kropp, så vit. Dora är bara ett barn för mig. Och hon såg ju så nära min fru. En man som Herr K. kunde inte vara farlig för henne. Så vit, hennes kropp, särskilt ryggen. En mild glans som färgmål. Det är han ofta att tala om skilsmässan med honom. Men det blir inte av. Eftersom Herr K. var en ömsigt far. Som inte ville lämna ifrån sig något av sina barn. Inte något av mina barn. Jag var hennes förtroende. Hon talade med mig om alla svårigheter i det äktenskapliga livet. Det fanns ingenting vi inte kunde tala om. Hon visade upp sig för mig. Det där leendet som hon låg mot sig själv. Hennes förtjusande lite kropp, de där små brösten, den släta huden på magen, jag älskar henne. Du kunde ni känna dig dragen till Herr K. när hans hustru sa så mycket ord. Var inte rädd? Så ja. Kom nu. Ta min hand. Vad är det som hindrar dig? Du känner mig. Slut dig inte för mig. Du vet väl att du kan lita på mig. På eftermiddagen, efter scenen vi själv, sträckte jag ut mig på skösslången i sovrummet för att sova lite. Vad gör ni här? Det är mitt rum. Ingen ska hindra mig från att komma in när jag vill. Hon gav mig mod att leva. Utan att känna till vidden av min smärta så inte ens jag når fram till. Jag kunde inte ens skrika. Här K. gav mig ett dyrbart smyckeskin på min födelsedag. På eftermiddagen när jag ville sänga in mig och vila fanns där ingen nyckel. Jag är säker på att det var Herr K. som hade tagit det. Det kan förstås inte vara likgiltigt om en ung kvinna är öppen eller stängd. Man vet vilken nyckel som öppnar i det här fallet. Jag visste att du skulle säga det där. Han hade aldrig haft lust att ge Herr K. en genbåda. Det skulle inte ha varit konstigt. Jag har aldrig tänkt tanken. Jag var rädd att han skulle komma in i mitt rum när jag klädde dig. In i hans. Det är jag som bor här. Du bor hos mig här. Jag tar tillbaka min nyckel. Nej. Om det är det där väskan ni vet efter så har ni det alltid knäpp. Jag har fingrat oavbrutet på den en timme. Den är för övrigt mycket söt. Är det första gången ni har märkt det? Det är första gången jag ser er när det här på. Jag har alltid och överallt min lilla väska med mig. Den hakar upp sig. Jag har fingrat på den eftersom jag inte kunde öppna den. Vi ser, vad tror du ni? Den är att öppna. Tycker ni inte att era ord kan anspela på något annat än den här lilla väskan? Jo, visst. Om det är det ni vill. Det är så man tänker. Den som tiger med läpparna fladdrar med fingertopparna. Ja, ja, jag vet. Och den som fladdrar med fingertopparna. Varför vrider ni pennan sju gånger i händerna innan ni talar med mig? Varför? Man måste respektera reglerna. Man måste respektera reglerna. Var har ni era cigaretter? Så är det Vi ses på tissa. Hemligheten finns hos er mamma. Före världen konkurrerar ni med er far. Jag visste att ni skulle säga så. Alltså vet ni vem som ersätter den? Veta, veta. Men ingen vet någonting. Vad betyder det? Att veta. Ingenting betyder någonting. Men vad är det som stod i er säng när ni var liten? Vad ska jag vara bra för? Vad är det ni vill få mig att säga? Så vackert allt var när pappa väckte mig och inte älskade någon annan än mig. Och nu? Herr K. röker. Jag röker, passionerat. Pappa är också en passionerad rökare. Ja. Jag 
måste jag fråga, jag måste fråga. Vem är det som ersätter vem i den här historien? Alla, utom jag. Pappa utnyttjar varje tillfälle han får av herr K. Och herr K utnyttjar varje tillfälle han får av pappa. Alla vet att de ska ordna för sig själva. Jag gick aldrig till den när pappa var där. Det var naturligt. Jag är inte arg på honom. Han offrade mig för den där kvinnan. Men hur skulle jag kunna vara arg på honom? Och vem då? Vem är det som bedrar vem i den här historien? Finns det ingen man kan anklaga? Och så får jag se varför ni känner er så förolämpade av Herr K.s inviter. Varför ser ni på mig på det uppfordrande viset? Jag ser inte på er på något uppfordrande sätt. Varför inte då? <laughs> ni vet mycket väl att jag är en institution. Har ni alltid tänkt på att er önskan om att er far ska rädda er från en fara stöter emot ett hinder? Tanken att det var er far som hade utsatt er för far. Vad har det med saker att göra? Mm. Är det allt som jag hittat? Mm. Vad har det för samband? Herregud, vad har det för samband? Denna kur är för lång. Hur långt är det kvar? Mm. Jag har sagt ett år, alltså är det sex månader. Varför inte två år? Eller två dagar? Jag behöver ingen guvernant längre. Hade ni guvernant? Ja, varför älskar ni pappa? Ja, min hustru kände att hon skulle skickas bort. Två timmar kände han var borta. Samma sak hände en guvernant hos här på. Jag har inte berättat förut. Dagen innan scenen vid sjön berättade den där guvernanten att här på hade bönfallit henne att inte neka honom i någon tid. Han hade sagt att hans fru inte betydde någonting för honom. Det, det är ju samma ord som... Gud, antingen vad ser det Ni vet att min fru inte betyder någonting för mig. Och jag ber er att förlåta mig att inte berätta något om vad som har hänt. Ni, ni bjuder mig på en cigarett. Sen går det plågigt. Vad är det för Jag tog emot cigaretten av slapphet. Men det är omöjligt för mig att känna återå. Var är min station? Min station. Det går jag då. Rövsen jag. Du har behandlat mig som en tjänstefickar. Jag överger dig. Ingen ska följa med mig. Ingen rör vid mig. Jag ska aldrig gifta mig. Vet ni att det är sista gången jag är här, Rottum? Vi säger det nu. Jag vill inte vänta längre på tillfrisknande. När du sänder ner för det här? För två veckor sedan. I samma uppsägningstid som för en guvernant. Ni har inte gett mig någon möjlighet att formulera, formulera mig färdigt. Ni hämnas på mig, som ni hade velat hämnas på Herr K. Och ni överger mig som han har varit. Ni förstår ingenting. Jag ska gå ensam, jag ska bli frisk ensam. Och jag överger er på en dag som jag har valt själv. Den första januari 1900. Kära doktor, ni är en institution. Ni får respektera en patient som vill er väl. Jag försäkrar er, doktor. Min dotter kommer tillbaka. Hon kommer inte tillbaka. För er kan jag inte Nej. Jag vet att min far har ett förhållande med fru K. Tänk om jag vet lite mer än ni allihop. Ni skulle kunna säga att ni är förtjust över mitt beslut. Eller bara ge mig en örfil. Jag skulle verkligen ha velat göra någonting för er. <hör> Ingen kan göra något. Skriv och berätta hur det går. Skriv till mig. Skriva. Det är inget som är. <hör> Hysterikorna är mina systrar. Jag har varit Dora. I alla hennes roller. De som dödar henne. De hon färdas igenom. Och de som hon får att rysa. År 1900 var jag hennes kväta begär. Hennes raseri, hennes stormiga handlingar. Jag tillät inte den småaktiga borgerligt äktenskapliga karusellen att snurra. Utan att 
gnissla förskräckligt. Jag såg allt. Jag sa ingenting men jag avslöjade allt. Till slut flydde jag. Men jag är vad Dora skulle ha varit om kvinnornas historia hade börjat. Uh, enter 
uh, the mysterious world of the, of the theater. And, uh, and then, of course, retrospectively, if I can speak about that, um, and because I was uh, looking for the uh, second time at that extraordinary piece of maths, um, it came to my mind that um, uh, probably one of the, um, the, the secret aims of my writing uh, has probably been the exploration or the contemplation of the mysteries of youth and age. Um, um, particularly uh, that of women, of those of women, but of course not without men. <laughs> so there's always the scene. Um, and um, we, are, we are all characters in this scene, in, on this stage. So I was just uh, taking uh, the first steps on, on this eternal stage of the, the quarrel and love um, between men and women, although I now, of course, these, these words have extended enormously to all kinds of uh, um, possibilities of exchange, metamorphosis, uh, and gendering uh, other genders, etc. I even took a lesson recently by going to the toilets here and, and discovering that in Sweden one tries to neutralize <laughs> this huge and uh, eternal quarrel. <laughs> Mats, Kamal, oh. um, Okdor, how did that, how did it came, come about? Ja, som du nämnde. English. Yeah, yeah. English. Oh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> As you mentioned, uh, hello everyone. Um, Birgit was 83 years old and she was recently not expelled but she had left the company, the company that she founded, 67. And it was a quite dramatic uh, event as she was uh, moved out or taking her uh, luggage and left. And this was my attempt to try to catch her uh, before it was too late. Not only that she had left the company and I have asked her to leave the company, but also that um, she was aging. And uh, more than half a year ahead, since I know that I wanted to do certain things, that you saw one third of the piece, uh, which could be considered sensitive to her, I needed her say. And I gave her a very de detailed concept half a year ahead during the summer for her to read and the music and everything should be clear enough so she really had an idea of what was waiting her. Well, she said yes, no doubt. And then we had two weeks uh, to do this and uh, then she looked at it afterwards when it was edited and she liked it, and she said, but what was it about? <laughs> and uh, that also catch a little bit my own uh, experience, that I thought I should have an entrance to Birgit due to this or through this work. But in their own end, yes, we have shared a new experience together, but I don't know her better. Mats, you, you have, I have, I think I know that when you do your choreography, you work out uh, the choreography, the movements in your own body in preparation for the dancers. Does that mean you did the movements of Birgit first? Uh, well, I imagined what, she, what was possible for her to remember. She had uh, problems with her memory. Uh, she didn't have Alzheimer's, but she had something minor, 
but anyway, diminishing. And uh, so uh, just the steps in, in fact. But I left one section, which you saw, in fact, in towards the end, where please, period, let us let the routine provides. And then she started to prepare, and she pray, prepared, but she got very frustrated because she couldn't remember the beginning when she came to the end. And she got more and more upset, and then we simply had the camera running, and she went on. And that's what you saw. But elsewise, I prepared more or less everything. Yes. And then what did you see when you saw the DVD? First of all, I must say that I was moved to tears. And again, this time, I think it's the most extraordinary thing I've ever witnessed, uh, except uh, for the last years with my own mother, uh, who, who left when she was 103. Uh, and I followed her. She started on her journey to what I call the Antarctic. Uh, she, she went ahead of me exploring uh, that region where uh, we haven't been, but we are preceded by our mothers particularly, and which is both cold and uh, totally unknown. So I was following her and taking notes all the time, because she was, she was teaching me, of course, unwillingly. Uh, and uh, so I went to the other world with her, uh, until she dwindled and, and waited for me on the other side of the door, because the door is most important, of course. So when I, I saw uh, this piece of love, because it's, it's, it's an incredible piece of love, what you did, uh, and and you you've given me the clue because I didn't, I didn't even I couldn't even guess how it, it, it was done. She, she's so incredibly beautiful. I also thought I hope you'll forgive me because I, ha I had met uh, Matt before. Um, suddenly it it was obvious that you have your mother's eyes <laughs> and your mother's smile, and you did her. As you just said, you, you did yes, her as uh, she was leading you and following you at the same time. This is an experience that we have, although we're not always aware that we, we should enjoy that uh, <coughs> sadly and, and with joy. Um, so I think it's admir admirable because uh, art, I think, uh, doesn't come to its power of moving us, of pushing us either to, to uh, uh, fits of laughter or sobs, uh, if it's not done with the help of love. Uh, love, of course, as a, a, a kind of superior intelligence, which he has. <laughs> <laughs> And then you, you talked about how you followed your mother the last mm. years, and um, you wrote a book, uh, Omer et Mort. Omer is uh, Homer, uh, but Mort in feminine. In it's it's difficult to translate. Yes, it is. Is it possible to translate it into Swedish? I don't know. It's, no? But in, in Norwegian, it's just um, uh, more Homer. And uh, it's uh, Homer, Omer is uh, O Mother, mm. O Mother, right? Omer. Uh, but one thing in the book is that you start it by saying, My mother wrote it before. And you have signed it together. Yeah. Er, er so, uh, yeah. Er so. yeah, it's it's her work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Can you? I just, I just copied it, you know. <laughs> uh, Omer, uh, well, I have always thought, or at least I probably guessed for, uh, in, in the last years, that my mother was my home mother. <laughs> she, she was the... Um, Homeros. And um, it, it plays on the signifier in French, that is, Omer, when you, when you hear it, uh, sounds like, oh, mother, but it's, so. 
and, and of course, again, there is a play on uh, gender, since Omer is uh, masculine, I mean, he's supposed, he was supposed to be a man, although we don't know about that. And, uh, and it, Omer then was dead in the feminine. Um, but as you know, Omer is a, Homer is immortal. So I, I was witnessing the immortal, or the, the, the mortal immortality, or the immortal mortality of, of my mother. And uh, while I helped myself, I helped myself follow her with writing, because otherwise it, it was unbearable. Uh, she was Eurydice, and uh, I was uh, Eurydice in front of Orpheus. I, I was, you know, I was crawling behind her and uh, taking notes because I didn't want to lose one single minute of the the huge adventure. Um, it's untranslatable, and of course, I. She had to. I mean, it, it, it's her work. It's her work inside, inside me, inside us. You mentioned uh, Eurydice. Right now, uh, we have started. Me and Anna Laguna have started a restaging of one of Beirut's, uh, Beirut Kulberg's last ballets that she did for the Kulberg Ballet, due to the 50th anniversary that will take place. I hope you come, all of you. Uh, in April uh, coming for 50th anniversary for a modern company that's not blown out of the nose <laughs> it is quite an event and for, to celebrate this we are staging one of our absolute best pieces done the later years which is Eurydice is dead oh. <laughs> and yeah, no this, this thing just occur, occurred I'm not surprised. No. <laughs> also, because it, just looking at this piece, fragment of, of the whole vision, um, what what Max uh, succeeds in doing very economically in writing, it would take 150 pages, 250 pages, to simply. Uh, reach the point where, where you see um, how uh, the, the young woman is, is alive and dancing out, in and out of the old woman. Uh, and, uh, and how the, the door is um, the gate of all experience. Actually, there's a door in Dora. Not, not, only in, not only in Dora, but in the play, in the play actually, Dora is always standing in front of the door. Always. There's a door. There's a door in Vienna, in front of which she's standing, and she doesn't know how to get to the other side, how to get inside, uh, how to, to be... Uh, admitted inside, it's it's a main theme for me, and of course I saw it immediately in in that work, and uh, um, all I don't know how how you how you managed except that I thought uh, well I, I couldn't help thinking that uh, your mother uh, sent uh, images and messages to you as my mother did to me. Oh yes, there are many messages. <laughs> As you know, every every moment, the moment of the night, the moment of the fish, etc., or the little tent, everything is is a it's it's a gift. Uh, well, from her. From her to mm -hmm. you, yeah. but but also from you to her because you you received mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, I want to emphasize, it's not really meant to be a portrait of her. But it is run it, out of her, but it's not meant to be a portrait. But I, I don't believe in portraits. I don't no, think no. a portrait is... Uh, you, can't, you can't make a portrait, you know. The portrait escapes the moment you, <laughs> you think you've got it. No, of no. course not. It's, it's always... I mean, portraits exist only as being danced. 
as uh, flying as as she does. You both have have spent a great deal of your life in in rehearsal rooms and in theaters. <laughs> really, um, what does the stage? Uh, what does this experience mean for you? Well, the stage, uh, as such, um, it is a birthplace, um, and if I try to imagine what an author has in front of her or him, starting to write an empty page, or a painter with a white canvas in front. This is two-dimensional, two but it has maybe plays the same part, I don't know, but I guess as a stage does to me, although a stage is uh, three-dimensional. It is a cube of air, and at each moment, of course, each theater defines its own stage. It can be long, it can be short, shallow, or wide, and so forth. But nevertheless, we have that designated area where things shall occur and happen. And uh, those uh, definition of that stage area is in the same time a limit. But that limit conducts its own conditions, which is very thrilling and demands a lot out of me and of course the dancers in the end to listen to and to use and to correspond with. For example, a certain movement or a movement sequence done in the center of that area, the stage, or in the corner at the far front or far back, comes different out, although it's, it is the same. But it's related to this area and those forces designed by that area, unseen if you don't really work with it, um, conducts a lot of, of the outcome. So for me, the stage is a partner and a contender, and uh, uh, it's, it's, the, it's the place where I forget myself and where I think I shall. It demands me to forget myself, but to present the issue, the subject, if it is movements or if it's your case text, or that's how I understand it. Ellen, the stage for you? First of all, of course, um, I, I got the message from Shakespeare that all the world is a stage. Um, and maybe the theatre is there for that, to remind us that the world is a stage. That is, that it's not my experience or Matt's experience, it's the experience of everybody. We always characters on a stage, on many stages, there are many stages on, on the stage. Maybe you're not aware of that. So uh, when you have a, a materialized stage um, as a kind of a summing up of all stages, then it, it reminds you of uh, uh, human fate. Um, I Dora, for instance, she tries to escape the stage, you know. Everything has been already uh, played, decided, and, uh, and she is looking for the way out, if, if it ever exists. Of course, looking for the way out is the, the dream of all revolutionaries. Yeah? Can we get out of it? Or do we accept the stage as the world, as it is a, a kind of enclosure and almost um, the, the threat of uh, an, an imprisonment. But I, I'd like to, to come back to one of the things that uh, Matt pointed to, that is how, what, what is um, the, what the, the, the stage, properly speaking, that is in the in theatre, uh, what it can uh, reveal to us as regards our own um, uh, way of life. And it has to do very concretely with enter, you know, when you read a play, enter 
exit. Out he goes, in she comes, etc. Well, this is nothing. It looks like simply a, a stage uh, direction. Hmm? Enter, enter. For, for the actor, it's enormous. You know, it's in, enter, but how do I enter? You know, they're there, and as, as he suggested, uh, each actor or actress is trying, you know, all kinds of ways of entering. You, you would think it's, it's very easy. It's not. It changes everything, you know. You enter this way, and it doesn't work. You, it doesn't, you're, not, you're not in, you know. Uh, probably you've missed something. Then try something else, you know. Enter this way, or front. Uh, same same thing to when you go out. You can destroy by going out this way and not there. You can destroy everything. It doesn't work. It becomes you know crumbles to pieces. This of course is very important. It's it's what you experience when you rehearse at the theater. But what does he mean? It's a metaphor. It's exactly what we do in life all the time. How do we get? How do, do we reach the, the, the center of the, uh, the situation, the position? Uh, we have to make decisions all the time, and they, ha and they have something which, is, which escapes us. We, we can't conceive of it, but it guides us. Uh, it, and it has to do with the, our kind of secret harmony or disharmony that we have with the general situation with the world, with political uh, decisions or uh, ethical decisions, or, or as as we know from the, the example of the of the Greeks, since we're all always Greek, we go on being Greek. Uh, it, it's also how to um, um, solve um, uh, the, the the tragic knot that is always there in, in a family, in society, etc. Um, so, what I see in, in, in Matt's work is, is exactly the, the illustration of what I'm trying to do now uh, with words, but it's that. The stage find, is... find the door, find the door, and there are hundreds of doors, you know, here, everywhere. Just, you know, just look around and you must find the door, the good door. You noticed there were some exits <laughs> because we prolonged. Uh, the stage is one thing. Uh, no. Can I, can I yes. ask that something? Uh, because to me, uh, when I thought about this with the stage and with the area of protection, or the area of all where things happen, um, I thought also a thing which to me often is a, another kind of stage. Yeah. Since dancers are dealing very often with very naked spaces, although defined, but naked, and when they bring, bring something on stage, it has some a certain importance to it. And in my case, I've been, in this case, over here it was the door, but much more often I had a table as mm -hmm. a sort of extra stage. Uh, and this table, I don't really know why, but I think I had seven different ballets with uh, tables within, as an important part of it, and one of those seven had five tables within. Mm -hmm. But the, step, the table as such creates a small stage on top, it creates something underneath, and it has this four-legged statue, like an animal, and still has this absolute abstract, sharp clarity around it. So it offers a lot of, of uh, possibilities in exchange with that table, at least to me. And I remember we have a Swedish, well, you know, uh, August Strindberg. Of course. Yeah. Uh, he wrote once, um, I think in Greenplay, the table that unites, unites and uh, apart. Separates, separates and unites. Mm. Uh, of course, but it's huge, and uh, 
<laughs> you really inspired. Because the, the table is, as you said, uh, it's the, the family table, which, you know, you can kill the, the parent who is uh, sitting opposite you. And instead of killing the parent, as you would do if you were in, uh, with Aeschylus, uh, you you eat uh, a piece of chicken, you know. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is the table of sacrifice. It's always there, mm -hmm. but it's also the door uh, having been flattened. Mm -hmm. It's it's the door, but it's a door with four heads. Mm -hmm. It's it's a cargo pit, and of course it's a kind of uh, a stylized animal. Mm -hmm. With, with whom we, we live. And, of course, it's the table of the law. Of the law. Of the law. Of the law. It's the tablet on mm. which you have written the laws. But you must, you have transformed it always, uh, often to uh, an, an animal. You know, uh, it's an animal. A creature, like... Of course it's an animal. Yes, it's animal. Marie -Louise Ekman put uh, feet. Mm. Well, it has, no, no. as I tried to explain, it has, to me it has many, many provocative possibilities which opens up things in me. And when you mentioned at the family table, uh, one of the strongest uh, memories of my childhood in general was the table where we met, which was not that often, but it was around that uh, small dinner table. Mm. where everyone had their seats and uh, the parents did get killed but many chickens were eaten. <laughs> <laughs> and you know that when, when you have a family table you can't change places. That's it's terrible. It. That's yeah. 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 It, they become magical and uh, they, mm. they're totally compelling. Mm. But regarding the door, uh, thinking about the door which is so important here in, in your piece, and uh, which has always been with me since I was a, a tiny tot. There have always been doors in front of which I was staying and wondering whether I would ever be admitted or not. And that was for real historical political reasons. I couldn't get inside. I was an outlaw, I was uh, an immigrant, etc. And now I thought the door has extended and it's become the wall, you know. We, it, we, we are in a century of wars everywhere, more and more wars, and of course it's just, and the wall, you, you cannot open it, you have to pull it down, it's very difficult. You, the word escape has, has come back sometimes tonight. I, I can see upon you as two people who escape in different ways. Right. You have to. I mean, you have. I mean, you have to try to escape. Of course. I don't know whether one ever escapes. Uh, I think that uh, somehow, when uh, the last scene uh, comes, and and it's it's finished, and there's a little book, you know, after the last scene, uh, then you may. Uh, discover whether you have escaped or not, but it's a bit late at that, at that moment. You always try to escape. Like once in, in Giselle, how, how should Giselle be free? How should be, she escape? She, she, her escape seems to be... Uh, the, Giselle is one of your major battles. In a way, she escapes into losing her mind. That's kind of freedom. Well, that's what's left for her, uh, but, but let's see, it has wanted to, um, so to say, come to what, what uh, your, your escape yes. gave me. Well, uh, I was dealing with theatre uh, quite much before I started to dance, and it, 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 got, it started very well, but it got less and less good. And uh, after a certain year, seven years, something like that, I... Um, noticed that I simply didn't have my feet on the ground. And beside one of my productions, uh, there was a, a, a production of West Side Story. A small town, in a small town in Sweden, and uh, the dancers of that production had their morning training. 
and I joined, and I joined them. And this was a revelation on my behalf. And I decided to go on with it for one year if I could proceed during my extensions that I already had contracted. And talk about escape. This was the non-escape thing. This was the this was the venue where you could not escape. The dancer by the bar, it's called the bar, not that bar, but this bar, uh, trains his body in a certain manner, in a certain ritual way, every morning to sort of place everything on the right spot and extend those possibilities that slowly are gained. And that uh, is the contrast of escaping, which on theater, uh, theater couldn't, I could grasp in theater, but would dance offer me. And that was a major part of, of my, what should I say, one of the, the most important experiences of my life, where I didn't escape. <laughs> I was forced every morning to have this recognition of the limits, of the failures, or the possibilities, 80%. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very impressive. Uh, I, I know that, but it's, uh, it's purely it's personal and biographical. Uh, I was born in a time of total cruelty everywhere in the world, and, uh, and my, half of my family was in concentration camps, etc. This is nothing, because it has happened to so many people. Uh, but it's true that when I was three, uh, I had a similar experience, which had to do with doors, bars, fences, frontiers, etc. And uh, at that time, very clearly, I was totally conscious, politically conscious, I, I understood everything. And, uh, but I had the, the faith that only small children have. So I thought I, I have to leave this world. I, I thought there's no way living in this world without becoming a humiliated prisoner. And, uh, and two years later, I, I discovered the, uh, the ladder that would lead out of this world. Uh, actually, I climbed up the, the tree too. You know, cause I, I was trying to climb up out of hell, and it was very simple. It was books, you know. And immediately I thought, well, this is the only world that is uh, open to uh, those who look for the non-existent freedom. So uh, I know that so deeply uh, that I, I, will, I mean, art is always a, a, the attempt to, to escape. It, it is, and, but, and I feel that it's a privilege. And since not everybody can escape, I always feel shy when I speak about that. Um, one can escape differently, of course. I mean, there's, there, there are arts that are immediately available. For instance, love. But that is full of snares. <laughs> <laughs> we talked about how you develop your, your dance work with your, your own body. I, in a way, there's a similar thing with with you, Milan, I think, if I ask you the question, how do you write? I don't mean the authorship, but I mean it very practically. How do you write? I, I, uh, I write uh, very physically with, uh, I, I consider that, you, well, that's my, my experience. I, I don't want to make it universal, but I think that it implies the whole body and it's very athletic. That is, if I'm tired, I don't try to write, because then I, I won't leap as high as I want to, or have uh, as many wings as I want to have. So, uh, then I write with my hands. And uh, do you have a special tool, as in a pencil or paper? Uh, as I said, 
confidentially. Uh, I, I have, uh, I'm, I'm a kind of painter. That is, I use what I call my my uh, paint brushes. I, I have on my on my table. I have about thirty or forty different pen pens pencils. Um, all, all kinds, uh, which I, which I use while writing, uh, as uh, the, the the moment of writing demands. Uh, I on 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 my on the surface I have a number of um, uh, papers of all kinds of uh, dimensions. Some are very small. Some are posters. Some are large. Uh, uh, papers on which I simply write this way vertically very quickly and for this I need every time uh, the possibility to change the, the instrument, the tool, which is there and I can blindly find it immediately. And uh, so I, I change. Sometimes I have to write uh, in, in a sick way, uh, sometimes in uh, in a very tight and uh, 18th century way of writing and feeling the, and feeling the page. Uh, but this is not my decision, it's the decision of the, the epiphany, the, the, uh, the vision which is materializing and lo is looking for, for words. But I must say also, I must add that I also write at night and it's uh, in, in complete dark. Uh, because sometimes I, my, my dreams uh, dictate something to me, so I always have uh, a notebook and all kinds of uh, large pens near, near my pillow. Uh, sometimes my cats sit on them, so I push them aside, and, and I, I write uh, nightly. It's very strange, you know. In the morning, you know, I have difficulties in reading what I've written during the night, but, but I can manage, uh, at least for a day. Later it becomes very difficult, because it's night writing, really. Mm. And what's your, uh, your relation to some of your dancers is very complex and intimate in a way. Uh, your work with Anna Laguna and Ivan Asueli, when you work with Sylvie Guillem or Le Classé, is there, are there words to describe what is going on? Uh, yes, of course, all in human intercourse is uh, complicated and rich and uh, dangerous and uh, beautiful in many ways, depends on what you do out of it. But I would like to emphasize that on my behalf, uh, I think the dancers, uh, as I meet them as a choreographer, it is a very simple relation uh, because I have then, as you mentioned, prepared the material of my body and I suggest it to them and they imitate. It's quite primitive. But in this exchange of information or attempts, there are a very subtle uh, dialogue emerging. And that's what I maybe tried to touch a little bit ahead. One had to have that ear and that eye to be open to those signals. So that starts the complexity to arose, arise out of this very, I call it primitive situation. I show, they imitate. The actors and or that, something else. That's absolutely something else. <laughs> <laughs> no, they had, they had another chance to prepare. They have the texts in, a, in advance, and they can deal with that text and do, do their notes if they like. But um, that was one of my major, I wouldn't say shocks, but, but it was a strong moment when I came back to theater after leaving Colbert Valley. Yes, you have done this six or seven productions at the drama. Yeah, yes. but the first one I did at City Theater, excuse me. <laughs> I mean, just to. Uh, and then the actor said, well, who am I going to say this or going to do that? 
they wanted a sort of pretext before they tried. And in Don's world, it is the opposite. You start from outside, and the outside provokes and offers the inside. No possibilities for those dancers that had the talent to read the signs. But first, when they had it taken it on into their own body, and this was a major um, contrasting experience that the actors wanted to have a certain uh, starting point which was already defined before they say the line or walk from that corner to that corner. This was interesting. And uh, I find it today, uh, since I've been a little bit more now experienced in theatre, this has opened up. So the actors today, I think, uh, are much more uh, aware of that there are different ways to reach towards something that is important. And you yourself, who or what do you imitate? What I imitate? You yourself. Oh. The, the dancer is going to imitate you. Yeah. And you? Well, uh, you know, I have those, you have your night writings, but I have my morning sessions. <laughs> and so every morning before I meet the dancers, I have a number of hours alone in the studio. I start to clean the studio, because always a lot of shit lying around, and I can't really stand that. It has to be a slow table under your control, and it has to be defined. So I start with, with my sessions with the music and the subject and the preparations that are ordered and with me. And I want to emphasize that this is my way, because uh, all, all choreographers have their different yeah. So it's not that I imitate, except that I go into a certain uh, mood or, or I'm caught by a certain way of uh, movements, listening to the music, having the space, and knowing what I'm trying to reach for. And then, when that is happening to me, it's happy moments. And then I try to catch that by small notes or repeating it. And often, like dreams, it slips away like this. But I have my technique to at least try to grasp uh, important parts of it. It's exactly the way writing happens. Okay. Mm -hmm. Helen, mm -hmm. you're, you're uh, you and actors. I mean, you are in rehearsals now. You, in a week, you have a first night at the yeah. uh, Théâtre du Soleil in Chambre uh, Land. Mm -hmm. Chambre Land. Mm -hmm. A room in India, yeah. And you are present during rehearsals. Describe your presence. My presence is, uh, it's very complicated because this is really unique. It's uh, what happens at, uh, in the Théâtre du Soleil specifically with m myself specifically. It's not, uh, you, you can't reproduce that. Uh, first of all, there is um, um, the condition of time. I've been working with them for 40 years. I've been there for 40 years. So, um, I'm, I'm part of the atmosphere of the work, of the, um, of the search. Uh, I think that I'm, well, I hope I am, but I'm sure I am, uh, reassuring presence. But, but for me, it, it's, a way, it's a very strange way of becoming the ghost of the company. <laughs> Uh, I am extremely active uh, passively. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That is, I bear witness. Mm -hmm. I'm there, I'm there, and they know it. They know it. They just feel it. Then I must add that I'm not there every day, because they rehearse every day. I am present two or three times a week, which is already enormous. Has it become necessary for you personally to be at the theater? No. <laughs> no. To tell the truth, you know, I always say that, uh, well, to, to, to uh, be part of the theater, yes. To be there all the time, no, on the contrary. Uh, my, my dream is to be there 
as little as possible. But it's huge, you know. Uh, I can't escape that. And I, I can't escape the, the unformulated demand. They expect me to be there. You know, they don't imagine that I could not be there. So, so it, it does look a, a little like a kind of maternal presence, I must say. Abstract maternal presence. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I always point to the fact that, first of all, it's, it's a special way that the Theatre du the theater Soleil has of rehearsing for at least nine months, which doesn't happen in other theatres. Mm -hmm. I work on, on each play, it takes me three years of my life. I count them. Hmm? I'm not so very rich. So, so I always feel that I'm extremely generous uh, until a certain limit. I accept everything, I'm totally on the side of hospitality uh, until it's, it's impossible, until I, I can't bear it anymore. So I look forward, you know, to the moment when we have the first night, and I can at last go away. <laughs> uh, because, as I said, it's a large part of the work is passive, and it's not at all my rhythm. Uh, the, the, the way the actors work, look for the, 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 the the mystery of creating a character or a situation uh, is uh, very hesitating, very slow. I uh, am as if I were uh, a mad horse, you know, I'm like that, but I, I put my, my legs under the chair and I remain completely still and quiet. And I, while thinking, I could do that in 10 minutes. It, it, but it's going to take a month. <laughs> so, so the rhythms are different, and of course it's, it's very enriching to realize the difference. Uh, what, what I receive from that is the, the total difference, and at the same time, the, the possibility to conjugate those differences so that we find something more, uh, an addition to uh, the, the creation. You are still at the theater, but when you have your lectures, and I know you will begin them again now, mm -hmm. would you think they are theatrical and performative? Anyway? Yes, but not as... Uh, yes, they, they are, because of course there is something in me which belongs to uh, theatricality. Uh, it's it's rather, rather tiny, because what I, I interpret is really writing, it's literature. And the theater is not that, it's, 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 an, it's another world, as dance is another world. It has other laws. Um, but uh, when I do something on my own, and I'm my own leader and company, it's easier. <laughs> it's much easier. <laughs> but, um, we, you have been reading some things by Ella. Uh, even in Norwegian, New Norwegian, and other play Dora, and um, you, have, you have met uh, the writing of Lansing Sue, both, both the prose and the, the writing for, for theater. Uh, it's a, it's a, I think there's a question here about uh, what is the difference for, for you, Elian, in approaching theater or writing books? This is the Dom, but this is Portrait de Dora. Is it two different kinds of writing? Oh, yeah. yes. 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 Yes, of course. Particularly in, in, my, in my experience, because uh, what, what I write as a fiction writer, or a poetical writer, uh, is almost symmetrically opposed to uh, the theatre technique and uh, the type of creation. Uh, for the theatre, particularly the, the one I practice, because one can do something else, there are characters. There are characters and kind of a dislocated narrative. There's something that, that uh, runs through uh, the, the work. When I write a fiction, uh, it can very well be uh, with uh, a million characters, there is all kinds of um, presences that are 
uh, other writers or uh, myths, etc., etc. But they are really uh, spectre-like, and um, the, the the main character is really the writing itself, writing, dialoguing with its itself, and looking further, uh, finding other treasuries in language. Language is, is essential. Uh, for the theatre, it's reduced. There, there's much else that happens. Uh, I prefer, personally, I prefer my own isolated writing, but I, I know that it needs absolutely its contrary, or its complementary. It needs the, uh, the l lightning bolt buoy a uh, uh, piece, whether it's dance or theater, uh, with which it reaches the public immediately and, and stirs the heart. Writing is very slow in its in its effects, and it, it demands enormously from from the reader. So, it's m both, I think, much it's much speedier than the performing. And very slow, and it's reaching, reaching the That was the pilot coming in, saying you can s switch off your flight mode now. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, quarter to five, and we thank Elen Siksu and Matsek. Thank you.